Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Today I'm mm. with a guest out of Australia. He's mm. worked with Steve Lacey, Sample the Great, Mark Ronson, gone on tour with Godier. Uh, he mm. recently, I actually found out about him because uh, he worked on Genesis Owusu's new pro- latest project, Smiling mm. with No Teeth. It's my pleasure to have the one and only Jaunty. Did I, pr- Hi. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah. Is it Jaunty? Yeah, that's right. Is that your real name? Yeah, it's my real name. Yeah, yeah. That must so, be like—is that an Australian name or some shit? Uh, well, it's actually as <laughs> as it, it it's could be, but it's a South African name. I originally from South Africa. So you were born there, but you were raised in Australia, or what's what's your background like? Um, so uh, I moved to Australia when I was thirteen. Got it. So I had like a childhood in South Africa, and then um and then moved here. Nice. So when 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 did you get started in music? Um, when I moved, I think, uh, okay. when I'm, yeah, when we moved, uh, originally in South Africa, I really liked art and I really liked, um, um, uh, yeah, I really thought I was going to become an artist or something or just with drawing and that mm-hmm. was my passion and then moved to Australia and then music just seems to be more, um, tangible and really fun. And, um, uh, and I think that just took over as the passion and then just got into music then. Nice. So when I was mm-hmm. talking to Genesis, I'm probably going to butcher it again, it's can canabera can, canabera oh. whatever <laughs> wherever he's from like where yeah, you, canberra canberra okay <laughs> so wherever mm. that is in australia that's like no that's like that's important that's like the capital right or yes okay. yeah, yeah yeah so it's, it's not uh, it's not wherever it's arguably important. the most important <laughs> city in australia so <laughs> <laughs> so so were you did did you meet Genesis and Canberra or whatever you pronounce it? or <laughs> where in australia did you move to <laughs> I moved to Sydney, oh. and um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I've been in Sydney uh, for quite a while, and I moved to uh, LA and New York for a little bit as well in between. Mm-hmm. But I moved back to Sydney. Um, uh, but I met uh, Kofi um, Genesis uh, when, uh, so I have another project um, with a uh, with a good friend of mine. His name is John Omar, and he um, he's from the band Jaguar Ma, and uh, he's been kind of a mentor to me for like uh, like over a decade. Mm-hmm. And then we have a project that's pretty new. It's called Mystics, and then um, we performed at a festival here, Splendor in the Grass, and um, and then uh, and then yeah, we asked uh, Kofi to help us uh, with a song, and. Um, and then yeah, he performed with us at Splendor in the Grass. But like, yeah, I, I think little did we know that we'd have like this uh, more elaborate future um, just uh, a few years later. And um, and you know, and you know, be on stage with him at at all these like theaters. And and then Jono as well uh, uh, MD the live. Uh, so Kofi kind of has like two performances. He has like one with the uh, with the goons, which is like more <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like more like. Uh, uh, you know, more performance theater um, and, uh, you know, more DJ oriented. And uh, Jono uh, put the music together, MD that show. And then, um, and then I'm part of the other show, which is the band show. And I think there's always plans to merge them or something, but um, uh, yeah. So we, but we both basically had futures uh, that we probably didn't uh, expect coming uh, in the Genesis Uwusu world, but that we're all very happy to be in. Right. So when when you mm. first started making music, were did you start out in a band? Because you've been part of a few different bands, or did you start out solo? Uh, I mean, I'd always been making music uh, solo in my bedroom, which I think it was like the first record that I put out on Stone's Throw, which was all that kind of stuff. And that's been all the stuff I was making in my bedroom in high school and all university. And um, but then I I think after high school. Um, I joined a band called Sherlock's Daughter, which is where I met Jono. Um, mm. And uh, and yeah, and then I had a then I tried to turn my solo project into a band called Danimals, and uh, nice. that's where um, then we worked with Mark Ronson and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, but it was still just solo recording. So uh, eventually, I was not allowed to use the name Danimals because it was a yogurt product in <laughs> the states. <laughs> It was really cool. I really liked the yoga product. I didn't know of it. It wasn't a thing in Australia oh or South gosh. Africa. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, I won this competition to work with Mark Ronson and then there was more publicity and stuff. And uh, Danon and the Danimals people were not happy with that. And they sent like a cease and desist, like immediately. <laughs> 
and I had to change the name. So I just changed it. I, the, all I could think of was just my first name, Sajanti. And that's, uh, so yeah, so I'd been in bands and, uh, um, yeah. And just, I just jumping around, I think in Sydney, there's like a small, I feel like it's just been a small scene and it's like all the people in the Genesis band as well as like all the people that I've just been jamming with for over like 10, 15 years, mm-hmm. just doing all noise shows and all types of bands and all kinds of things. So it's, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I always, always love playing bands. Hell yeah. So what, what year would you say the Danimals project was around? um well it was around 2010 okay uh which is when we won this competition and we yeah and we flew to new york and um uh well i was living in new york at the time but uh um we all went to new york and uh we recorded electric ladyland and that's where we produced the song with mark ronson Mm -hmm. and that was the only danimal song it's it's still out there it's on youtube it's got a very it was um uh, it's called a uh, fox or rhythmic fox it kind of changes name depending on which video you click on mm-hmm. but uh um yeah we only released like one proper song and uh yeah, it was tied in with this competition wow like in this day and age i feel like sponsors are so relevant like I, I, there's always been sponsors <laughs> but like nowadays if you just came out with animals today i bet yeah. animals would be like let's sponsor you somewhere and yeah <laughs> we'll give you a danimal sponsored podcast or whatever it is I was all because I think the music as well was really uh, similar to the aesthetic of the product. And mm. I was I, I tried one attempt of being like, listen, I understand my name's Danimals and your product's <laughs> Danimals, but there could be an opportunity here. Like I'd love to like I, th- I really think the um, the sound would cross over with the product. And and I thought that and initially my aesthetic was very much like the Danimals aesthetic with like cartoonish and like yeah. the red and the, the logo. And I was, and, and I was always had this other thing that was called Danimation, which is like <laughs> what I would describe the, like the sound design version of what I was doing was trying to make it more like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon or something. So I'm very cartoonish. And, and I was like, guys, Danimation, Danimals, like this really <laughs> something like, yeah. And they just, nah, I just went forward with that cease and desist and uh, they, they got no time for like just some indie musician or something. <laughs> well, that kind of means you made it a little bit, right? Like if you had to have something going for you for them to send you a cease and desist, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, it's definitely like a little bit of an ego boost as well. You're like, wow, this company really thinks I'm a threat. This like multi-million dollar corporation. Yeah, you could frame that on your <laughs> wall. It's like a plaque at that point. <laughs> yeah, I do. I still, have, I still have the letter it's like <laughs> such yeah. a unique kind of <laughs> Wait, yeah it's pretty cool do you guys do you guys have gogurt in australia uh no i don't think so I, i'm probably wrong on that uh, but i can't imagine seeing it so gogurt is fucking gross mm. just like dan i don't know if you've <laughs> <'Cause> dan <Daniel's laughs> gross i didn't think i've even had dan oh god i think it's like how do i just disc- i might get hate for this but i feel <laughs> when i think of Danimals, I think of like artificial yogurt. So yogurt mm. in itself is already like, I think yogurt can honestly be pretty hit or miss for people. Like I'm, I've never once yeah. in my life like craved yogurt. Okay, so mm. then imagine and like the fast food version of yogurt. Okay, <laughs> so that's what I think. Dan, and have you seen what Danimals comes in? It comes in like it looks like a fucking juice box. So you're like. <laughs> It's kind of gross. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty cr- gross. But isn't that, it would be cool when you're a kid, right? Yes, like kids love it because that's yeah. what it, it's a fucking yeah. shape that's like yogurt you're drinking. Kids will yeah, yeah. anything. Like you can, whatever, <laughs> SpongeBob looking whatever. It could be like, it could be like <laughs> fucking a meatball and a SpongeBob looking thing and kids will eat it probably. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but go- Gogurt is like the animals, but instead it comes in like, how, how do I describe it? It's like a t- it's like a tube, oh, yeah, and you like yeah, rip yeah. the top and you like slurp it. It's, it's like a straw yeah, yeah. that you rip open and you slurp yogurt out of that. <laughs> <laughs> like, there, was this, there was this, there was some phase, I guess, in the early two thousands. I don't even know when it came out. I just remember it being like a childhood thing for me, at least. That yeah. there's all these but, different. But did you like it as a child? No, I hated it. Okay, okay. But yeah. there was you could um. It was all you could freeze gogurt, and then it would be like a popsicle, and those were kind yep, of yep. all right. But I don't know. Like I didn't. I wasn't really a fan of fucking 
Oh, you guys, I don't even know if you guys have like, do you have like lean cuisine or fucking yeah, l- Lunchables, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. got like a- equivalents, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know. A lot of food marketed towards kids usually sucks, in my opinion. <laughs> it's true. Unless it's fucking very true. fruit snacks. Especially, actually. yeah. I remember when I was in America, I was like, wow, this is like the food that kids have is like so gnarly. It's so like crazy. <laughs> I can't believe like they f- feed it and oh my god and and the cereals yeah like delicious like like captain crunch or whatever and all yeah. that stuff and absolutely delicious but like like deadly i can't believe it like australia is really a lot more healthy with that kind of stuff but uh america is just ooh, oh my god yeah like, i can't believe what kids eat there yeah the, the obesity rate here is pretty pretty insane Mm-mm. yeah it was uh i mean it was it wasn't too, in south africa i remember eating like lots of really heavy foods and i was a really big kid and um uh and just uh yeah food there also quite um just heavy and sugary and um and yeah i think just uh, australia uh, that's like the one thing like i really appreciate that in australia it's just like <laughs> come back when traveling and food here is just a bit more chill just a bit more like ah okay yeah. a lot of have like just yeah, yeah a, a lot of older artists mm-hmm. that um Fuck, what's older even mean nowadays? Like, I'm, I'm saying, like, <laughs> listen, so artists in their 30s. How old are you, by the way? I'm 34, so I'm there one of go. these elder musicians. <laughs> this is yeah. your, this is your age group. A lot of these 30 yeah. year old artists I know start to become vegan. You know, that's what I've been saying. Mm-hmm. Like, what, okay, how, are you are you even that group at all? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I've, uh, I think. Uh, um i think that was too ingrained in me i tried for a little bit i think in south africa like it was all meat all the time and just mm-hmm. just, just meat and then um i feel uh and my partner she's chinese and she's just always introduced me to like the most amazing chinese meals that are all very meat based i'm like yeah. i just can't go back and um and i tried in new york as when i lived in new york i think we were living next to a place where like uh, i just remember um like you pick the chicken and then like they they kill the chicken or cook it for you or something and it had the place the smell out of this place was oh my god heavy just heavy smells and just um and i think from the and i remember being like ah oh, that it just made me not want to eat meat so for like a good few months i was off meat and then uh, i just reverted back to my old ways i guess and that's how it goes mm. uh, the farther mm. away you get away from the actual experience of seeing the animal die it's like mm, this is this burger is good i don't care about yeah. the cow at that point <laughs> yeah are you vegan or vegetarian or, no i'm um, terrible i'm trying to fix my diet honestly like my favorite food <laughs> i'm not afraid of my favorite food is like fucking ice cream at the, like <laughs> <laughs> i mean ice cream is great i love yeah, it i mean yeah yeah oh it's great everything in moderation though you know yes yeah yeah so I work mm-hmm. on it, but I feel like I, I have such a fast metabolism right now, at least. I, I feel like I should enjoy it while I'm young. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you seem pretty healthy. I feel like I'm, as we mentioned before, the elder musician. So I'm like, my body, my metabolism's not so, uh, uh, so I have to like be extra careful right now. I'm like, um, I'm like, I eat ice cream and you're like, you seem pretty healthy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so so h- how old were you when you uh so, yeah so you lived in two of the biggest music hotspots even in the world la and new york what was mm-hmm. what were your experiences like for uh both um cities i heard some i've, I've heard mm-hmm. what is it new york's very like hustle and very fast mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. i forget what they say about la but it's also very uh, it's the opposite <laughs> and uh yeah i think uh, i i found yeah those cliches new york uh again i was just um a very just fresh out of high school and not very experienced in life so i was mm-hmm. quite uh, taken aback and it was very intense and also it was quite very s- silly i think when i look back because i moved over with a band and the band i was playing in sherlock's daughter we all decided we've got to move to new york you can't if it, there was a real stigma at the time like you can't stay in australia you have to like go overseas if you're gonna like try and make it or whatever mm-hmm. and uh we all moved to new york and um and my role in the band was essentially to play like a nintendo ds on stage and uh <laughs> so i was just like i wasn't even really uh i was like yeah i really moved my life just so i could just be on stage and play nintendo ds and, wow and uh and uh it was pretty funny and but yeah i didn't really know how to um keep up with everything there it was very fast-paced um but i love it i love going back and visiting new york's uh uh, it's just awesome 
And then LA for me, I, I feel like that is like my second home. Uh, just because, uh, yeah, I signed with uh, the label there, Stones Throw Records. And, um, uh, and, and as soon as I went there, I just met so many, it was just, yeah, I, I spent many years there and I go back and, um, and I, I just absolutely love LA and, uh, just, just, yeah, I feel like, uh, if I wasn't here, I'd be over there, I think. Dang. What was that? Was that like <laughs> scary to move to New York, like fresh out of school yeah. like that yeah. sounds like a that's like a whole diff, that's a whole different country and yeah the most like hustle yeah. and bustle place you can move to <laughs> yeah i think so well i think the the other band members seemed more confident and i think there was a real exciting energy and you know when you're like what was i must have been like 20 or something at the time you just uh um you just have that energy you like and especially when you're in music you want to do the most exciting thing you want to be in the center of like all the craziness and um and so you just have that energy and it's more the excitement and uh it's it wasn't like oh, i need to move here to right. do this it's like we want to be there like where all this stuff is happening and it was so exciting and um uh um yeah i think it was just over time that i just realized i wasn't equipped i think with <laughs> knowing how to live there and uh right uh and and then i came back to australia and um so when you uh, when you were in Australia, though, like, were you part of like a music scene, or were you kind of just doing your own thing? Uh, well, I joined. I feel like the music scene that I joined was very much all the people in the Genesis Owusu band. Mm -hmm. All those, um, all those musicians are all. There was just yeah that scene, and it still seems like it's the same scene, but plus more people, and you know, there's always new scenes in Sydney, and uh, but yeah, I felt very much a part of the, the scene at the time, and. There was like a few venues. It was like, you know, maybe like two or three venues where everyone would just always be at and always be playing at and you could do a gig there and um, and you could just hang there. So it felt like there was more, very much a scene at the time. Gotcha. So mm -hmm. so how many times did you move from the United States back to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I moved oh, twice. So I moved. Okay, so the timeline is, in 2009 10 i moved to new york mm -hmm. um and then 2000 and during 2011 i came back and then in 2000 late 2011 2012 that's when i started doing work stones the record so i moved back and then i was there for a year and then um uh and then after that it was like around 2013 where i moved back to sydney and uh and then that's kind of where i've been i've been going back and forth like you know like but more like i guess work trips or whatever got it but um um but yeah to that since 2013 i've been like back in sydney for good i think so let, let's break mm. down your carbon footprint <laughs> <laughs> oh that's dangerous <laughs> so, so, so have you so you've been part of Stone Throws record for like ten years then, or has it been like? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, this uh, last last October was the ten year anniversary of uh, my first record on on Stone's Throw. That's insane. And, uh, yeah, which is pretty. Yeah, it, I didn't. It's like it is insane for me. I I've never like fully processed that as well. <laughs> is there any like uh, advice for other artists to stay on a record label that long? Is it? <laughs> Like, <laughs> uh yeah i mean well for me it's just uh um uh, i mean they were like my favorite label so it was a it was a typical dream come true scenario um but yeah I, I guess times are changing as well so and it seems like i don't know it seems like it's um uh uh you know there's more conversation of artists you know owning their stuff now and uh better you know better negotiations and people moving into web3 so they could own everything and still support themselves etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. so it's hard to know i feel like it's all changing at the moment but um uh, but yeah it was you know uh, it, it helped me a lot being on stone Throw and um and uh, yeah i had lots of good experiences are there any like major artists that lots of people like know off their top of the head off their top of their head that's part of that label as well uh yeah so um uh so the main three would be uh, uh that were like had the most cl like classic records and stone so it would be um mad lib oh. and jay diller and mf doom and mad villain uh and um 
and uh so those are and then like um you know more commercial success like mayor hawthorne and Allo black and um and then uh you know and and, and also like more modern artists like mind design and sudan archives and um um uh yeah and just uh and knowledge and uh knowledge and anderson pack had a record and they had no worries and wow um yeah i mean this goes on and on and uh there's just been uh like yeah uh millions of like just uh, i guess like kind of more uh sometimes it, it's a bit more like cult artists i guess but the, just for, for me they're all my favorite artists and um uh yeah it's uh it's a pretty uh, like the roster and the the discography. If I could, if I could have any labels discography, like, yeah, you know, like it would be that one. That's pretty mm-hmm. crazy. I um, mm-hmm. one of my guests I just had on recently is part of Rhyme Sayers record mm-hmm. label, and MF Doom was on Rhyme Sayers too. So I wonder if yes, yeah. So if you're on like multiple record labels, it's, it's kind of like having multiple credit cards, kind of. If you think about it, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, there's with. I think record labels are a little bit like maybe relationships or something. So maybe it's like, you know, maybe if there's arrangements, you got to like, everyone's on the same page with all the different things. Yeah. Uh, I think it works out, but I think with MF Doom and Stone Star, it was very much, um, I'm pretty sure it was like more like they were taking care of the collaborative work with Mad Lib and they had the Mad Villainy record together and, uh, and a few other things. So, um, uh, so, uh, it wasn't necessarily, like I think you know it could have been on different labels at different mm. times as well. Mm. Got it. So, mm. so, but that seems like it's most those art. A lot of those artists you listed off though are like mostly like hip hop related. Right? Would you mm-hmm. say you're in that hip hop genre also? Because it seems like you're more like psychedelic or. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I think the, the Stone Throw's initial uh, identity seemed to be, um, uh, yeah, more like really hip hop based and. And then um, I think Peanut Butter Wolf, who's the um, uh, who's the owner of the Stone Star Records, the founder. That's a crazy um, name. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a he's a crazy man. He's a, uh, I love him. Uh, uh, and uh, and yeah, and that's very much uh, his personality. I think is uh, yeah is is very um, yeah is, is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, um, and he, I think uh, for him, he didn't want. Uh, stones throw to be uh just known as this like hip-hop label and for him his own interests are like you know he listens to all kinds of music psychedelic music new wave music punk music um like you know all uh just uh you know it's like his record collection it's just every genre and i think he just wanted to i think when i came on it was like i think uh there was definitely more of a initiative at stones throw to try to branch out of um uh just uh just it was just to do more genres and i think uh right uh, at first it was met with a bit of resistance from the fan base and maybe some people at stones throw um um because you know i think they just had such a good thing going with so many classic hip-hop records um but i think yeah i think over time it's just shown that like you know the diversity and uh, uh it's been uh yeah i think there's there's you'll find everything at stones of records i think <laughs> yeah that, that's that's really mm-hmm. dope though so like how, how was your experience getting onto the record label did they just see a song that they liked by you or did you reach out to them or were there a r's involved or how was that um so uh so basically i created my first record it was called toilet gig um and and then I was looking on the back of all the Stone Throw records, and those the, they all had like the, mainly like the same mastering guy, Dave Cooley. Mm. Um, and um, and I you know, and I always loved the mastering on all the records. Uh, uh, yeah, he's like an, he's super amazing. And um, uh, and I sent him an email, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm just a you know big fan. Uh, I was wondering if there was possibility of like you know like mastering this record, or what's the you know I, I don't know, just see if you'd master the record. Mm-hmm. And then he was the one, he was like, he listened to it and he sent it to Peanut Butter Wolf being like, hey, you know, hey, Chris, Chris is his name. He's like, I think this is something you might like. And then he passed it on to him. And uh, um, and then, yeah, and he really liked it. And and it got, th- and then I got a phone call from Peanut Butter Wolf. And it's like the, one of those typical wow. like, cliche stories where, <laughs> where you get a phone call and you don't believe it's them. And then you just like, you know you're like freaking out and you're sweating you don't know what to say one of those situations and yeah. uh yeah and um uh yeah so and then it kind of worked and then i was doing this like mark ronson thing at that same time 
uh, and so yeah i was i was like in a yeah it's just a lot was happening very quickly and like whereas uh, in like whereas a year before that i was probably just in my bedroom and just making all the stuff so it was, it was cool wow that's that's really dope so <laughs> my uh one of my last guests um their name's communicant they're a band mm. out of la and they're a psychedelic psychedelic pop band and yeah. um i was i was asking the the lead singer about like what was his experiences getting into that type of music and yeah, yeah. His, his reasoning was that he really connects with like surrealism so i, I was yeah. wondering what, what were your motivations into getting into psychedelic type music uh yeah probably surrealism but probably more escapism i think mm -hmm. i'll always love that um element of it that uh i just um yeah, I think, I don't know, I think, like, just listening to psychedelic bands, uh, I think, like, when we get into music, we listen to, you know, Jimi Hendrix or something, and I think uh, the more, like, out-of-world uh, elements seem to really take me to, like, another world or something, and that seemed mm -hmm. like a magic place, and uh, I think, um, and then, and yeah, and I still like, I still don't really, and it was funny because I'm not really like into psychedelic drugs or anything, nothing against it. It's just, yeah. It just doesn't, I feel like psychedelic music and psychedelic art um, uh, is, it, just, it seems like a totally different thing or something. And it's more, for me, it's like more about uh, like creating a, like a magic world, escaping to a magic world or something. And, uh, and I feel like that's what I'm always trying to do, at least in my solo records. Yeah, that's super dope. Mm. That, that was so, the communicant guy said the exact same thing. His name's Dylan Gardner. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I love psychedelic music, but I don't, I don't do drugs really either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's because yeah, crazy. I mean, uh, I've had two acid trips and they were, and they were uh, very great, but, uh, I, I like it's, it was just a completely different thing. It's just more like having fun with your friends or something. And, yeah. Yeah, it's a but, it's an uh, it's an easy sell in actually I don't know if that's a if this if it's an easy sell but mm -hmm. for because like here in Seattle we have a pretty crazy um, homeless population mm -hmm. and a lot of them are on meth or whatever type mm -hmm. of drugs so I was gonna mm -hmm. say it'd be, it's an easy sell for parents to be like don't do drugs kids because uh, you'll end up like the homeless people but then again there's so yeah. many of them I wonder yeah, if that yeah. don't do drugs thing really really works or not <laughs> yeah it's i mean people do drugs all different types of reasons and uh, sometimes it's like no option and yeah. uh, it's uh it's probably like there's probably another reason before that reason that needs to be addressed uh and uh you know drugs deal with the you know anxiety everything and um uh, so uh yeah so i guess yeah it's i, I wonder i mean that, that that's a, that's a deep topic <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've I've heard like psychedelics can be fun, but I've I've heard that some for some people it, it could just take like mm. one time ever doing it, and then you're like <laughs> you're fucking in another dimension for life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally, and that that is like super scary. And uh, I think uh, yeah, I think it just depends on like I think where everyone's at. You have to feel like comfortable, and like you'd have to feel like you have like your friends around you, and uh, and and like you know probably be in like greenery and trees and stuff or something like that but uh, i do think i still think it's like i would if i could if if you could give me the best um psychedelic drug experience or the best psychedelic music i think the music one just like not even in yeah. this close competition and if i could live without uh, uh, i could easily live without uh, doing psychedelic drugs ever again uh, no problem but yeah i think it's just a completely different thing i think there's like a I don't know, something about like music and art when you get like that like natural world building um uh, like it opens up your brain element it's just like i think with with drugs i found like i know i'm being like artificially controlled or something i know right. something else has taken over and uh, i really don't like that feeling maybe it's like a control freak thing or something but uh, there's always that element and uh, it's always uncomfortable for me and so i had like um yeah it's just something uh yeah uh I don't know like I wouldn't yeah like it, I think it's it's I think it gets like it's both like yeah like I don't know could easily live without it basically yeah I feel like music is the real escapism like move yes. like because you're making your own just like a book if you're reading a book you're they yeah, might yeah. describe a character but like you know like whenever a movie comes out from a book mm -hmm. there's always debate on like this is not Harry Potter actually looks like when I'm reading yeah. him <laughs> or whatever it is but like 
in music, yeah. it's like music definitely means different things for each person from the yes, person that yeah, actually yeah. wrote the song to the person who produced it, even maybe to mm. the person who mastered it, to the person mm. listening to it, to the person's like family listening to it, it could all to the person who has a, they have a, the person who made the song and their relationship, maybe their boyfriend or girlfriend has a different experience. Like everyone has a different experience, and like you know, it's yeah. real escapism when like, like I don't, I'm, I'm guessing you drive, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, like when you're driving and listening to a song, and the next thing you know, you're like you're 20 minutes down and you're on down the road on your trip. And you're like, how the fuck did I get here? You know, yeah. like when you're like <laughs> that, you could really space out when you're listening to music and driving. Oh my god! Yeah, absolutely. That's a yeah. So many wrong turns, and oh my gosh, yes. yeah. There's yeah. There's one CD in my car that always messes me up, and it's a it's a, re- a record by Yes, Close to the Edge, mm. and it's basically the first track is this twenty minute like opus, like probably the, yeah, definitely one of the coolest records ever. Wow. Um, and uh, and it just and there's all these like really emotional changes within the song so you'll be like driving you'll be like rocking out and then you'll be like crying in the middle and then, like you're going through the whole journey and then i'm like shit where was i meant to go and i'll be like <laughs> suburbs away from where i was meant to be and happens all the time that's crazy and, uh, and yeah it's just and it's i always want to listen to it in the car because it's like i love that journey and i love the the where the song takes you and then but it always messes me up so it's like double yeah. sword yeah i had this um do you know the rapper of the game yeah, yeah, I had this. Uh, I haven't collected them lately, but I used to collect CDs like all the time up until yeah, yeah, up until a couple years ago, not even that long yeah. ago. And before I sold the car, my last car, mm. I would still listen to CDs just for nostalgia, even though I had mm. like Bluetooth and everything like that. And I had all I'm mm-hmm. like I keep CD cases, just like um, some people have like those CD like uh, boxes not you know like those things where you yeah, can like put box multiple, sets yeah oh, right, right, right. Like, like the, the you can like put all the cds in them in your car um what's it uh, called? yeah like the sleeves yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah. a binder type thing yeah yeah so like yeah. some people do that and throw away the cd cases but i love the cd cases so i have like a whole rack full yeah, of yeah. cd cases but basically um yeah, i didn't yeah. realize that i had put the cd case away but i left mm-hmm. the game cd in my old car and then i sold mm-hmm. the car and then mm-hmm. the CD was still in the car, so yeah. I guess someone ah. got a someone got a free CD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's yeah, I, it's you get emotionally attached to like CDs are underrated completely. Also, just because there's like no real like need for most of you know <laughs> who's got a CD player outside of their car, even in their car these days. Yeah. So, um, but they are completely underrated. And I, I had to do that recently. I like. I had a massive tub of all my CDs that I like collected through high school and just decided to like, I'm never going to listen to these. So I threw them all away. <gasps> but when I threw them away, I had like a piece of my soul died and I felt so much like oh, emotional turmoil, like for these like CDs that I was never going to listen to. They were all scratched up. They're all like, yeah, I don't know. They're like, but a big tub of CDs. And I was just, uh, yeah, CDs, the, yeah, can be, I definitely understand that nostalgic feeling you'd have with the CD or yeah. something. And, uh, and, also, you know, you remember buying it. You remember yeah. like looking at the booklet and all that kind of thing. And the yeah. thing that's it's so sad because like CDs do not hold value whatsoever, but like records <laughs> they hold all. value. But yeah, <laughs> it's fucking nuts. But they sound awesome, and yeah. I, I find like uh, whenever I'm like switching between Bluetooth or the CD in my car, the CD is like I'm maybe it's just because I'm you know I guess just always working on like being attentive to them. probably most people it's fine yeah but cds sound like crystal clear feel like jumping in the ocean like beautiful yeah. and then i switch to bluetooth and it's all like crackly and yeah like, uh, yeah so i think there i, I think CDs. i think there is an actual like a loss of sound quality when there's because there's like a bluetooth connection you know mm-hmm. what i mean maybe I'm, yeah totally and, and you're, you're listening to like a stream which is like i don't know like the cd is like a web file it's uh you know, it'd be uh, like probably 50 megabytes each song where like the stream is like um, one megabyte or whatever. And oh, that's true. Uh, 192 kilobyte. Uh, I don't know, you know, like just like very, very low MP3 quality where the CD is like the full as you heard it in the studio to the car kind of thing. Oh, that's a, that's and, a good point. Uh, yeah. So, And then plus the whole Bluetooth is something happening. Yeah. You know, it's like transferring. Ah, there's, there's something going on. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that wild to think that there's like just like Wi-Fi and like uh, 
phone signals like there's like so many like rays and everything just we're walking yeah. through every single day <laughs> we can't see it but that, i wonder if that uh, affects our health at all you know what yeah, I mean? yeah yeah i remember there was a lot of talk i remember with cell phones and testicles yes really <laughs> <laughs> like a kid who fucking testicular cancer or some shit yeah yeah that conversation seemed to have quietened down over time but yeah, yeah i just remember that was such a huge thing we're like they don't know yet like you gotta have this phone in your pocket your, your <laughs> testicles are gonna go nuts or something <laughs> yes i remember <laughs> so do you do the do you do the car test when you're like you're making a new do, do people do that like you know like the new when people like are making a new song before they put it out some people like listen to their headphones some listen mm-hmm. on speakers like do you do the car test at all yeah, it's not so much a test. It's more just like, ah, oh, like just experiencing the thing you made. Like, be, it's just fun to listen to it in the car. I don't really be like, ah, oh, that's not working there or whatever. Because, mm. uh, you know, I know my car system is not very truthful <laughs> or something. <laughs> but um, uh, it's just fun to listen to. I think my always with the making an album, my goal is to make, yeah, kind of like this like psychedelic experience that like, is a bit of a journey same thing with that yes record i'm trying to create something that has like ebbs and flows and like is something where you'd go on a, a road trip and you'd have uh, feel like um you can you're just going on this musical journey as well um so i, I like to see if it's got that effect i guess and, right uh, i like i want to try and make something that has that effect so yeah um so yeah i guess that is the test i guess that makes mm-hmm. sense so on uh, Spotify, your biggest song right now is with Steve Lacey. How how did that mm. collaboration come about? Um, I think uh, I just remember. I think before he was like, I think he had just joined the internet. Mm. But I remember he was just tweeting at me, and then I like went to his page and I listened to his music, and it was like the greatest stuff I ever heard. <laughs> I, like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my god! And uh, I think he had like SoundCloud, and I was just uh. Yeah, I was like, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Like, just absolutely. And then, and then eventually, I was in LA, and then yeah, met him. And uh, it's just, I think it was like when when we did that song, "Screwed." We called it "Screwed" because he had his high school uh, like graduation the next morning. I think we were up all night, and he was saying he's basically screwed because he's like spent, he's got graduation like the <laughs> next day or something. So yeah, I like, couldn't believe like uh, just the. The town, I still can't believe it, but um, wow, uh, it's it's uh, but then also like he was making all that music on his iPhone, and that like still blows my mind. I still don't understand how, and and wonder like <laughs> yeah, and this, all that uh, his first EP has like the sound quality. It sounds like uh, like a classic record and stuff, and and yeah, and I just remember him coming with, like a like doing it all like on a Squire guitar and like a plugging into the iPhone and singing into the iPhone. Wow. Um, it was I've oh my god I was so inspired and just uh and then yeah and his guitar playing and his chords and I think we were just uh loved hanging out with him and we had like just lots of fun and uh, I've hung out with him a bunch in Australia he comes to Australia a bit and uh and yeah and then I just remember we did that yeah that we did that screwed song the day before his like graduation and uh and yeah it's just uh always so inspired by steve and um and just uh, love his like progression as an artist and um uh, just yeah he's awesome that's dope yeah. so you, you yeah. grew close with godier also when you went on tour with him um mm. it's so crazy to think how long ago somebody i used to know was what is <laughs> do, what is what is, do you even know what godier is up to nowadays that was how long ago that was like 2012 Nearly. that's almost like 10 years or so that song yeah, yeah. i still love that song a lot but like mm-hmm. that's he's 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 literally the somebody that i used to know now you know what i mean well yeah i mean he he's uh he does a lot of um so i knew wally before uh the tour and uh and go to wally's his name wally the backer mm. um and uh and he was also just someone i guess like on myspace and would just i would always be so inspired and he was he was making the music that I loved in Australia. Like no one else is making like sample based pop music like him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and w- we were friends before like all this stuff. And, um, uh, and then, you know, his real passion is like, you know, and also I think since then it's been preserving like almost synthesizers and, uh, and, uh, the specifically the Andia line, uh, 
uh, which is like uh, um, like a very first synthesizer, almost like a theremin um, kind of. Uh, yeah, it's just basically like he's and he's done a lot of shows around that, and he's done mm-hmm. a lot of uh, preserving, doing the stuff that he really wants to do. And I think I have to say, out of everyone that could handle uh the situations that he was in being all of a sudden this like massive uh pop star and like you know watching him handle the tour i feel like out of everyone he's probably the musician i probably respect the most and uh, almost as a person as well i think like really for me he's uh, uh almost like what i see as really integrity uh i think um i think uh, i just think of how he acted and how he's uh, been and uh um and ha- handled that whole situation and mm-hmm. um how he makes music he's always doesn't it's like he's never doing it for the wrong reasons he's always helping people and he's always um uh yeah really like someone i just look up to as a human being so much and uh and you know sometimes you you, you think maybe you'll see someone go through all this um craziness like i couldn't believe what was happening like we were on the tour bus and then you know so many people like making like such funny like fan art like where they're making like uh like buff naked guys and they'd photoshop his face on it and give it to him as present you know all this kind of stuff and they'd follow us around in the tour van and all this kind of stuff like and then uh having all this media circus around and um you know people like yeah like memes or whatever all this like kind of uh just any i think anyone else would have just like gone insane i think but he really just um watching him handle it and still stay true to himself afterwards i think uh, uh meant a lot to me i think and just uh, he's uh, and i think yeah i think he's just you know i think when he's had a i know he's had a child and he lives in new york and hmm. um and he's always working on something i've heard music that he sent me music that uh, or played me music when i saw him last and um yeah he's just a uh, he, yeah he's just an amazing man that guy have you ever worked on any music with him? Uh, well, he helped me with the last record. Uh, there was a song in there called Staring Window, which mm. we put out a video clip for. And and he like, uh, and basically when when we, the tour finished, um, I, uh, I looked after, he came, he came to Sydney to watch, there was a series of Kraftwerk shows. Mm-hmm. So he came to watch the Kraftwerk shows. And I went to his, um, his farm that he was living on at the time where his family's, uh farm uh house and look after his cats <laughs> um, and uh and when i was there he let me use the studio and i i made a bunch of the toko rat songs there um the l- last record i put out mm-hmm. and um um and and then he when he came back he we helped he helped me with a bunch of the songs and um and yeah i feel like we've made a, a bit of music together but yeah we'd always love to make more that's dope so it seems like you've actually been like centered around a lot of these artists at the beginning of their careers a little bit like you worked with steve mm. lacy godier mm. got genesis of wusu now like seems like <laughs> you've made a lot of the right connections uh i just think i just I, I think it's with musicians all around the world it's just i feel everyone's just orbiting around this like same thing and then mm-hmm. that you can hear it and uh and then you're just i think i i, I mean there's definitely no i don't know no plan i don't I have no like real logical answer for that kind of <laughs> uh why that see, see but uh i just think yeah i just think um uh, actually in australia as well so s- small scene maybe in seattle it's similar mm-hmm. um but uh, uh uh it's just it's a small scene and i think if uh you just all orbiting around the same thing so you all just like land up working together being in the same places and um and uh yeah i feel very lucky to have uh yeah, just I think that's been my main joy of this musical journey so far. It's just meeting these artists, uh, and um, uh, just yeah, and just feeling like there's just a c- community, I guess. And um, uh, and and also just when traveling around the world and seeing how many people are in that same orbit, you're just like, wow, so so crazy. Because you feel yeah. like I remember when I was making the first record, Alone in Bedroom. You feel like lonely. You feel like there's like not really like you're not gonna have a place or something. And then it just like didn't turn out to be true at all. It turned out that like there's every like in any country in the world, there's all people is orbiting around the same thing, and it's like so cool. And I love that, and it's been like such a joy. And I think I think that enthusiasm that uh, like it makes yeah, you know, it gives it gives so much energy, and it makes me you know. And then there's more even in Sydney and stuff in Australia. There's just more and more kids coming out. Like I'm just like wow, and <laughs> like you know they're just. Uh, uh it's just awesome so i think uh maybe it's just maybe that excitement i guess maybe 
uh, helps, uh, you know, just see what, what, uh, what's happening, I guess. Yeah. It seems like you're doing it for all the right reasons. Hmm. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. I think, uh, I think so as well. Uh, unless do you want, a... do you want world domination or something? I, I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, that's, that's for another podcast. Man. That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, no, nah, I, don't, I don't know what I would do with world domination. <laughs> what would I do with the world? I would just make everyone buy synthesizers or something. I don't know. <laughs> so do you, do you have your own home studio or how, what is your like uh, process like? Yeah, this is a studio now. Um, Hell yeah. it's, it's always been home studio uh, since day one. I think it's just more comfortable. Um, and uh, um, yeah, it's just uh, it's really just, you know, there's like two synthesizers here. It's like the sampler, record player, nice. a few guitars. Um, uh, and then, yeah, in the cupboards, there's all toys in there and stuff. And But uh, always home studio. I just find, uh, I mean, I love proper studios jamming with a band in a proper studio is awesome mm -hmm. but um yeah it's just for what i do i guess yeah with the sound design and really trying to take it to like a, a deeper i don't know feel like mental space or something to try to find the magic place i think is easier in a home studio yeah like i feel mm -hmm. like uh billy eilish kind of opened a lot of people's eyes mm -hmm. to the fact that like you can win a fucking grammy from making a project in your your home basically Absolutely. I mean, even that the Gautier song, somebody I used to know, that was also just Wally at home. Oh and, wow! You know, and sampling records and just making it. Uh, yeah, it's just in his uh, barn uh, in Melbourne. So <laughs> that's yeah, tough. Think, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I will say I do love like this. I I feel like you don't need. I mean, like even Steve Lacey, like he made the. Uh, like some of the best music I've ever heard, like on his iPhone, mm -hmm. uh, which we all have. We all have like the capabilities, but I think there's, I, I do love both. I love, um, there's something about getting into a studio and there's a board and all outboard gear and, uh, and you know, setting up and, uh, you know, recording the tape. And uh, the, I feel like both there's a pros and cons to, the, or there's just pros to both. And uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's just different solutions, but no one should ever feel like they don't, uh, you know, there, there's always ways to make whatever music you want. Like, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. What I, what I've heard from other artists is like, actually even a lot of industry artists, they don't mm -hmm. make all their music in, in studio, especially cause mm -hmm. studio time costs a lot of money. Like I think even mm -hmm. Kanye has done some of his projects from like hotel rooms and things yeah. like that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, it's definitely awesome. I think I was really inspired. Uh, so like the biggest Stones Throw record was Mad Villain, mm -hmm. Mad Villainy. And um, and that record, most of the beats were made. And there's photos online of just uh, the studio that Madler would make the beats in a hotel in Brazil. And it was a, it's like little Fisher Price record player. Uh, a little sp303 sampler which cost like you know 200 bucks at the time mm -hmm. and then going into like a little uh and then his speaker and re recording system was like a, a little uh like boom box with a cassette player and, <laughs> and all those beats that are like these legendary classic beats and everything uh, just made you know like recorded to like this little cassette in a hotel room with you know like you know like nothing and so I just like yeah, it's just awesome. It's just yeah, it just makes you feel like you have the power to create whatever you want. Yeah. So so for an artist like yourself, what are some like revenue streams that you have? Is it directly through the record label, or is it you producing for people? Uh, I mean, it's always up and down, always changing. Uh, I think uh, live music um, helps the most, mm -hmm. uh, and doing gigs. Um, and then, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, a bit comes from like streaming and, uh, I think producing and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, it's just basically like everything all at once. And then I do, I do make music for like, uh, you know, like scoring and ads and that helps a lot as well. And, um, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like wherever it can come from, like just, just got to go for it. And DJing as well, DJing. And nice. But yeah, de definitely. I think live would be the most important. I'd say. Yeah, I have, you, as an artist, you definitely have to have multiple ways. Ooh. I think the dream thing, though, is to if the, all those ways are music related, you know, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's yeah, really absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, over the past few years, I've always like sometimes because it's like especially with COVID and stuff. Uh, sometimes you know, and there's no gigs, it's like funds go down, and 
all the stuff and then you know just had to do like retail jobs anything like just mm -hmm. back and then i'm back and just like at the moment it's all music right now um and then but just you know you just got to do anything and sometimes and but that's almost like part of the the yeah just like the um the i feel like you take that risk being an artist i guess yeah 100 uh, percent. and i think the 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 veil is being slowly uncovered especially in the last few years where it's like uh, i feel like artists had to like kind of hide if they were like you know like pretend like they were just all like living financially super comfortably but you, you know we all know the realities of like it's very hard to like be uh, uh like to maintain a sustainable uh like, like just career as just a you know musician especially making like non-commercial music all mm. that kind of stuff so i think the conversation is always opening up a bit more which is i think good because it just helps address those issues and you know like you know feel like you know but um uh yeah there's always so many different ways and uh and yeah it's, it's always changing as well right so so for you how how, how has covid uh, affected you was it mostly negative was there some positive to it uh i mean well the i think the the uh, uh, from a musician point of view it was just like there was you know a good two years without shows mm -hmm. so uh like so that was very i guess yeah that was the challenge in that time um but otherwise uh, i mean it was just you know just seeing everyone like just uh you know like trying to cope with this thing so it wasn't i didn't like have any like nothing was nothing really happened it wasn't like too much of an obstacle for me personally um but yeah i think it was just uh, it's definitely much better now that shows have come back and all yeah. that kind of stuff and um and, you know and i, I yeah just uh, just i guess seeing I guess the whole world's been adapting to COVID in real time, I guess. Yeah. Is it, and what's next for you? Is there any new projects you're going to release? Any new singles? Any shows? Uh, yeah. So uh, um, so I mentioned John Omar earlier mm -hmm. and, uh, and our band Mystics. Um, uh, that's the next thing that's coming up is uh, there's a, a festival in Sydney called Vivid Festival. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we're, we're putting together like this audio visual performance and, getting back into that whole headspace and then uh shortly later that month is like a, a solo show um which i uh i'm performing um so i've been working on this record uh for the past couple of years it's called the moon blades mm. and it's uh, inspired by like movies like the warriors and the wanderers and all kind of like movies like that um uh and uh and yeah it's just like the next junty record i guess and I committed to saying that I'd perform like at least most of the songs from the record uh, at this uh, venue here called Phoenix Central Park in June. So right now, yeah, just working on like working on the, yeah, just this record and wow. um, to perform it in June. <laughs> We've got to do an album release interview then when it drops. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that'd be lots of fun. So, and you have you not released any like a solo music? Like when I looked at your Spotify, at least it, I think your last solo stuff was like. 2020 has it been two years for you or i i've probably been like five years i think really? the last official music i must have put out oh well last 2020 yeah in 2020 i put out a remix of a uh, great band bush kabula mm. um uh, and then um uh but then the last solo jaunty records was all the last uh record which is all in 2017 yeah so it's been a long time yeah yeah and I guess I just haven't been in solo mode. And uh, yeah, so, so I'm very excited to get back into that whole thing. Wow. Did that that time kind of fly by for you? Or was it, what was yeah. that like not releasing a record for five years? Yeah, well, it's funny because I didn't release like a record five years before that. And mm. that was like the whole main story. And I had like so much, uh, they were like, oh my. And when I like released the record, it was like, you know like i guess the media things would say like it was kind of almost like a return or come you know like a like he's like come out the darkness or something like kind of narrative where mm -hmm. it's been ages but it's been five years and it probably might be long until it gets to be released this time but i think it's just uh um i i feel like i've gotten used to uh, you know taking quite a while for a record which is not my intention my intention is to make as many records as quickly as possible but mm -hmm. um yeah i think uh I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I feel like, um, yeah, hopefully I can get into the groove more this time. And um, I think, uh, um, 
yeah, just figure out how to release records better and quicker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how how do you how do you main, maintain like a a fan base though? Like, are you still connecting with fans during off period, or do you kind of feel like you have to gain fans all over again when you take breaks? Um. Well, it's I don't know. I feel like it's always I've never really. I've never really had like a um, like a full representation of like the fan base, I guess. Like I never really mm. get, do many solo shows like just on my own. Um, uh, and, uh, and you know, I guess like you get Spotify numbers and things like that. So it's always, you know, it's almost something where I don't really have control over, I guess. Wow. And, you know, I'm always trying to do as much as I can as like for uh, like my own solo, you know, brand or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, there's always little things uh, happening here and there, but, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just, I've never, I just, you know, you just, all I can do is really just make the music and, and, uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, the people, there's been people there, there's been people, new people from like, you know, it happened last time as well, where uh, I hadn't released music in ages and then gathered new fans from like, you know, maybe working with Steve Lacey and, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and I was producing, uh, yeah, just for artists at that time. Um, you know, the might find me, but then there was people that knew me from all the stone Throw stuff. There's people that knew me from the animal stuff. <laughs> I think it's the same now. Like it's just, uh, uh, there's all, it's just fan base from, um, might know me now from like, you know, see me around like the Genesis of Wusu stuff. And yeah, but also know me from the stone throw thing and then maybe know me from you know like it's just you know it's something i i just keep going and i don't really have control over um uh, like and i always try to engage with any fan base that's always there so it's a so um yeah so i guess just make the music and let and it's there for whoever wants it <laughs> that is so wild yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> you, know, you know how many artists like literally kind of struggle to find like a fan base to grow with and you're like oh i'm just gonna release music and i'm still able to make music full time though so i'm not too stressed out about it <laughs> <laughs> well i mean yeah that's it's, legendary it's, it's just, man, it's just well, it's, i don't have control over it i just can do what i can do and then it's it's there so, uh, very happy for anyone that's i'm very great i'm very grateful for anyone that does listen and enjoy it but yeah it's, it's just I, you know <laughs> it's, awesome. i don't have control <laughs> that's wild well my, my final question for you is what is some advice that you have for up-and-coming artists creators influencers um uh i think uh uh, I think it, like if I could go back in time and um, uh, and make um, you know give advice, I guess, or uh, uh, so things that I think maybe like I wish I listened to more myself. Um, uh, I think it's yeah, I think it's really uh, you know really you know like your your music or your art or whatever. Um, uh, it you know it's your special place it's your sacred place almost so um don't uh don't feel uh like um uh, i guess yeah don't feel like you'd have to um uh, cheapen it in any way or disrespect it it's like you know it's it's there for you to like be yourself and when you're yourself you help other people be themselves i guess mm-hmm. so um um uh, so yeah just uh um, nurture your uh, your wild weird magic place. <laughs> <laughs> nurture your wild weird magic place. <laughs> from Sounds Johnson. like a children's show, right? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Yo Gabba Gabba. Uh, <laughs> like some advice I'd give on there. <laughs> sounds good. And uh, what is the easiest yeah. way for uh, people to reach you? Uh, uh, I guess I knew. Um, uh, probably. You can slide into any of my DMs on Instagram, Twitter, um, email. It's all out there. There we go. This has been the <laughs> the NAS podcast with Jaunty. And we did it. <laughs> <laughs>